Okay, so hello again, everybody, and uh, welcome back to Public Art Now Conversations. Um, just in case there's anyone who has not joined us before, just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Gronia Cochran, and I'm the coordinator of this event. So I'm just sort of emceeing uh, for the last time here. So our next and our last conversation of Public Art Now will focus on public history, monuments and commemoration from an international perspective. And in doing so, reflect on the means to negotiate the significance and potential of complex legacies of past monumental art. So this session is chaired by Dr. Nee Van Kelly. Nee Van Kelly lectures in contemporary visual culture and the history of art at the Dublin School of Creative Arts, Technological University, Dublin. She teaches on the BA Creative Industries in Visual Culture, MA in Visual Culture, and supervises PhD research on art museums and memorial practices. She has published on contemporary art, art histories, and commemorative visual culture, and is author of Imaging the Great Irish Famine, Representing Disposition in Visual Culture for 2018, and also Ultimate Witnesses, the Visual Culture of Death, Burial, and Mourning in Famine, Ireland, and that was 2017. Um, so before we go into this, once again, just to remind our attendees to keep your mic switched off. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please do so throughout the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Or if you'd like to drop in a resource or a link or just say hi, you can use the chat function to do so. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Neva Ann. Thank you, Veronia, and thank you to all involved in this organizing this final pa panel conversation. Um, the last two and a half days have been, as uh, Karen Corcoran hoped in his opening words, both stimulating and informative. My name is Neva Ann Kelly, and I am delighted to chair this closing session of the conversations. This panel, Public Art, Public History, Monuments and Commemoration, takes as its point of departure recent contestations of monuments statues in particular, in the public domain. Across the globe, the last decade and since spring 2015, with Roads Must Fall specifically, there has been a concentration of questioning the representation of historical experiences in public places. The statues of historic figures have been a physical and metaphorical focus for greater questioning of historical values. Lived legacies of colonialism, the afterlives of historical slavery, the impacts of conflicts, effects of migrations, and imperialisms of both archiving and memorializing the past have focalized upon the objects and sites of cultural heritage broadly and the lexicon of historical values they denote. Decolonizing museum collections have been notable on curatorial agenda since the 1980s. And similarly, the plunder and looting that underpins histories of material wealth are more overtly outlined in newly revised histories of grand houses and financial patronage, for example. However, it is the towering forms of large scale stone or metal objects installed in shared open air public spaces that appear to have generated a broad public interest in and public energy about what it means and why it matters to visibly, physically and sensorily rebalance the historical record of the past. Today, as we hope to move towards and plan for post-pandemic landscapes with greater awareness and value on the outdoors, the open air spaces of our common world will have renewed significance as public places may well need to function more effectively as truly shared spaces. So our squares, streets, parks, and other urban and rural open spaces might become more active sites of community life than any of us can remember not just eating, drinking, shopping and moving through, but meeting and being together again through an expanded variety of activities. The historical commemorative forms that linger in such spaces clearly need to be continuously reflected upon and the memorial practices to come, their emphases, forms and duration require sustained and careful consideration. Over the last two days of this conversational conference, Many of these themes and issues have arisen from policy consultation processes, durational concerns around installation of art in public places, and steadily growing social and ecological awarenesses. 
to discuss these and related concerns of how, why and where public historical practices are reflected by and through public monuments. I am joined by four distinguished, experienced and passionate advocates um, of the importance of memory work in the public sphere with a breadth of practical and research experience from across the globe, the panel took five key interconnected themes as a cue to today's conversation. So I want to just very briefly outline these themes before I introduce the four speakers. So each of these themes raises many questions um, that are also implicated in broader social and cultural pressures today, as I just suggested. So the five themes or conversation starters were briefly, um, the first one, public art, public history. And as we've all seen in recent years, debates on naming places and symbolic acts of social activism in shared spaces, all underline how the location of monumental public art are increasingly sites where public historical relevance is debated and social movements are expressed if not declared. So how might dialogical processes around claiming the past be made possible through public monumental art. And to borrow uh, Harriet Fenney's phrase, how might we conceptualize teachable monuments? Our second key theme, whose monuments, whose heritage? So entanglements between past lives and present collective identities reflect on contentious relationships that continue between material culture and world making more broadly, uh, which includes, of course, the, the desires for decolonization of cultural heritage. So what functions might newly reconsidered relationships between heritage sites and memorial public art provide for rethinking um, the use and conservation of material cultural heritage? In other words, what is the fate of the statues or the inherited legacies in our public spaces? And how might cultural tensions associated with um, inherited uh, conditional attachments to forms and materials of conventional monuments be reworked to suit uh, site-specific and culturally specific contemporary contexts. Our third theme, and as you can see already, these themes have a lot of overlaps. Our third theme was, is centered on contested history. And contested histories point to historical and territorial tensions, but also perhaps to the failure of permanent structures to adequately memorialize past or recent events considered of significance. Within this, the issue around national identity and its relevance for monumental art today is present. And also of interest uh, to at least two of our panelists directly is that in periods of reconciliation, such as post-apartheid contexts, how can monuments function in terms of commission, development, form, and location? What meaningful processes of consultation are possible? And some of this came up in, in earlier discussions uh, earlier in the week. Our fourth theme is around the idea of the monument or memorial practices as response. So as we know, formal art commissions are time consuming and burdened by many, many logistical concerns. What are the potential advantages of more interim or spontaneous memorial forms for historical legacy, legacies and the geographies of monumental art? And what is needed on a practical level to facilitate those kind of responses? Fifth, uh, thematic that I asked the panel to consider and that came up in our earlier discussions was around good practice. I think we're all interested to hear what are samples of good practice that our, our panelists have come across or experienced? What have been the factors that enabled monuments success or significance uh, in terms of both local and visiting publics and how might monuments be um, assessed uh, in terms of their impact? The format for this panel is truly conversational. The panelists will each refer to a set of sites that they have formal familiarity with and or deep experience of. All the panel welcome questions in the Q&A and we will get through them um, later or sooner whenever they appear. So please feel free to type in at any time. So what I want to do now is to introduce the four speakers um, before inviting uh, Harriet to start. Um, the biographies are available in your pack. I will proceed to inadequately reduce um, reduce that kind of biography um, to, in order to move on to the conversation. Professor Harriet Senny is Professor of Art History and Director of Museum Studies. Um, 
at City College New York and at the Cooney Graduate Center. Her contribution to the field of public art is extensive and reflected in her work as author and editor of numbers of volumes on public art, her teaching, research, and her active advocacy and contributions to public art commissioning and socially engaged assessment processes. Harriet was recently appointed to the task force on monuments, statues, public art, and historical markers by the New York City Council. Now, her current book project is Monumental Controversies, Mount Rushmore, Four Presidents, and the Quest for National Identity. Professor Cher Kraus Knight is a professor of art history at Emerson College, Boston. She served as a memorial advisor for the Boston Marathon Memorial, with an emphasis on temporary and non-permanent options, and as a public art scholar on the Art Committee for the Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King Memorial, also in Boston. Cher is currently on the visual arts team for the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project at the University of Pennsylvania. This interdisciplinary project seeks to explore the various ways the arts and humanities relate to well-being, for which Cher serves as a public art researcher and co-author. Now, Harriet and Cher have collaborated on a number of seminal projects on public art, including launching in 2011 the journal Public Art Dialogue, which is the only peer-reviewed journal devoted to public art. In 2008, they also co-founded Public Art Dialogue, an international organization that is also the College Art Association affiliate. Cher and Harriet have also co-edited key anthologies on public art, which many of you may well be familiar with, Museums and Public Art 2018, and a companion to Public Art 2016. Dr. Dwayne Jethro is a junior research fellow at the Center for Curating the Archive at the University of Cape Town. The centre works actively with many different kinds of collections, developing curatorship as a creative site of knowledge and aims to practice to open up novel combinations of the historically separated domains of the creative arts and truth claiming discourses of history and social science and natural sciences. Duane is working on the cultural construction of heritage and contested public cultures and his book Heritage Formation and the Census in Post-Apartheid South Africa, Aesthetics of Power was published last year. And then my last introduction is for Tom, uh, sorry, Dr. Timothy Rybuck is a historian and co-founding director of the Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation based in The Hague. The Institute seeks to address unresolved historical legacies in multi-ethnic and multicultural societies with the goal of promoting understanding and inclusiveness. Tim publishes widely in the public press, such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, and has published history books, including his 2008 book, Hitler's Private Library, The Books That Shaped His Life, which is translated into over 20 languages, and 2015, Hitler's First victim, Victims and One Man's Race for Justice. As part of his work for the Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation, Tim is lead editor of Contested Histories in Public Spaces, Principles, Processes and Best Practices, published in February this year by the International Bar Association. This book outlines 10 selected case studies from a multi-year initiative intended to address controversies over statues, memorials, street names and other representations of disputed historical legacies in public spaces explored through I think 180 case studies from across the globe. So finally, um, to the conversation, and I now invite Harriet to start off with her response to any or all of the themes that we have discussed so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nivan, and thank you for this invitation. Welcome to everybody. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are here this morning. Um, I wanted to start uh, with the whole controversies over Confederate memorials. I think that's when memorials became a really hot topic in the United States. And if I can have the image of uh, General Lee on Monument Avenue, thank you. Um, Monument Avenue was planned as a sort of the centerpiece of a very upscale real estate speculation. And along Monument Avenue were a number of statues that celebrated the Confederacy and celebrated the heroes of the Confederacy as national heroes as opposed to traitors. So Robert E. Lee, this is who we're looking at here, um, who was the general of the Confederacy. There was also Jeb Stewart, 
who was a cavalry commander, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, and a couple of others. And then way at the end was Arthur Ashe. That's a whole other story. But taking a look at this particular statue, this was the first statue on Monument Avenue that you would see as you entered this uh, wealthy conclave. A conclave which at the time this came up, Black Americans could only enter through the rear doors. No, there were no Black Americans living along this street. So when this went up, the commissioners chose a French statue because that had more credibility in terms of art. And also, interestingly enough, they wanted Lee shown sitting on a horse that had all four feet planted on the ground because it was hoping that that would convey the message that Lee was so powerful, all he had to do was give a little tug on the reins and the horse would go. So again, this, this whole monument, Monument Avenue, but Lee in particular, were a way of casting these Confederate heroes as national heroes, as opposed to traitors, which is how, of course, they have come to be seen now, so what we're looking at here is Lee before and Lee after. The statue of Lee recently became the focal point of all kinds of demonstrations and graffiti actions in objection to Confederate memorials in general. And, and what you're seeing here is the way it really was covered, the way it was occupied, and the way there were performances going on here. And the question I kind of wanted to start with was one that was raised this past spring semester in a class on memorials that I was teaching, which is a number of the students, these are or graduate students, felt that the statue should be maintained in this way, not taken away, that this was now the monument that should stand in the place of this and that this was an appropriate statement of protest. And the question I put to them, well, isn't it graffiti? And wouldn't what is it exactly that we're celebrating? And is this the best way to celebrate protest? So as usual, I have many more questions than I have answers. Thank you. I see Cher, you want to come in on this. Uh, yes, what a surprise. I have something to say in response to Harriet. Uh, her thoughts um, generated two thoughts for me. Um, a lot of times response comes in the form of either addition or subtraction. So when we're looking here, the, the response had been uh, an addition in terms of graffiti, which, it, you know, technically, legally can be considered, of course, an illicit act but also uh, you know, in terms of socio-political context can be seen as claiming space, uh, oftentimes in a space where you have been marginalized or have not had an opportunity and to kind of have your voice heard. So we may not agree, you know, not just this panel, but even beyond this session and, and in the larger world that the graffiti may not be the exact kind of right gesture, but it's interesting that the technique, the tactic was an addition, which is not necessarily stealth here. It really kind of hits you in the face. Um, the, what often also happens for response is a removal. And in the case with Lee at Duke University, they've actually removed the sculpture of Lee that was on the university chapel. Uh, and uh, it took, it was kind of vandalized for a period of time. And then finally they decided that's it, we're not putting it back. And that was a, a definitive gesture. And it's actually that absence kind of works because it's in a niche on the building next to an image of Thomas uh, Jefferson, who was a slaver. So I'm interested to see if he stays in place. And Sidney Lanier, who was a, a poet, and a writer, but also served uh, in the Confederate Army. So I'm interested to see if he stays. But that absence is kind of very um, notable. And this tactics of either adding or removing to the memorial becomes a way for the audience to announce its presence and sometimes to push back. If we could have just for a second, and because I saw Dwayne's hands up, my 
my image of the McNeil marble works, the two uh, pieces of Confederate uh, memorialization. I just wanted to make this point that I think hopefully will enrich our conversation as we go on. Um, thank you. If we could have them in, in the full mode. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, this kind of point that was trailing in Harriet's remarks, sometimes what we want to talk about is the aesthetic value, the historical quality and historic value of these works. I just want to bring up, um, these are very different circumstance from what Harriet was showing. The McNeil Marble Works basically operated a catalog ordering uh, business where you could order up a Confederate or uh, you could also order up a Union soldier for your memorial. There was very little difference in them. And you're seeing two views here. The one on the left in front of the Henry C County Courthouse in McDonough, Georgia, was finally removed last July. They had a petition of nearly 14,000 people calling for its removal. The one on the right, the Colquitt uh, County Courthouse in Moultrie, Georgia, that's still in place, but its status is pending. And there's been a lot of um, protest and a petition as well there. I just want to point these out because uh, two things are really important about them. One is that you can't really make the distinction case or the argument about artistic distinction. These were kind of almost anonymous works that were ordered out of a catalog that are duplicated, particularly throughout the South and the United States. The second thing is they give us a chance to acknowledge that there were a lot of kind of stealth bad actors uh, that often got on notice. So here in the case of the commission, the daughters of the American Confederacy uh, were the commissioners. That was an organization that was allowed to kind of uphold these racist legacies because after the Civil War in the United States, women did not have to swear a loyalty oath, which men did, and they were not allowed to participate in politics officially. So while men who survived the, you know, the, from the Confederacy and might want to have celebrated those efforts couldn't publicly and legally do so, the woman did. So this gives us an opportunity to think about what makes something artistically distinguished. Where did the patronage come from and, and why? And so I just wanted us to layer some of those issues into the rich ones that uh, were provided by Harriet to kick us off. Thank you, Cher. Dwayne, um, if you would, I see you would like to come in now. Absolutely, and, and thanks to Grania and thanks to yourself for the invitation to speak here today. Um, if Rishon can please um, upload image number three uh, that I have. Uh, the image that I'm going to show is from a memorial in the province of the Eastern Cape. It's a memorial for uh, four uh, struggle heroes that were ambushed and killed by uh, the apartheid state in the late 1980s. This is a post-apartheid memorial. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's in a kind of rural area. And what's significant about this memorial is that you can see some of the lettering has already been removed. So I highlight this example of the vandalism of this monument as a kind of juxtaposition to the Lee monument. In the two cases we find that with the Lee Monument, you find this, this uh, outpouring of public sentiment, um, valid public sentiment, and, it's, and it's, it's publicly inscribed on this monument. But in, in my particular case, you see another set of public sentiments that are very difficult to distinguish. They're not necessarily about um, uh, the fighters that were involved. They're not necessarily about the state, um, but they very definitely have to do with um, the social polit and political conditions that um, are prevalent in that area. So there's lots of poverty um, and um, uh, unemployment as well in that area. So what I'm trying to highlight with this example is firstly that you cannot distinguish between, you cannot distinguish the political motive sometimes of the vandalism that you see on monuments. So that, that's difficult to distinguish in certain political uh, um, uh, conditions and, and, and and places and, and, and this is something I struggled with in my own PhD research. So how do you tell if someone has a political motivation when they're making an inscription on a monument? The other point I wanted to highlight was, um, I thought it was, I would also be moved, um, I'm very much like your students, Elliot, to uh, preserve the graffiti on the Lee statue. 
as a kind of symbol of that particular moment, the uprising and the sentiment that was evoked by the death of George, George Floyd. And it's highly significant and it circulates as an image around the world. It's really captivating. But we also have to recognize that um, sentiments change over time and that what is today appreciated as a really powerful statement tomorrow or in a few weeks time, we, it will be recognized as something that, that's really um, difficult to look at. So that tension between um, commemorating the moment and um, having a kind of, yeah, a future outlook that's um, the, working that tension and, 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 and um, in terms of commemorative practices is, is really interesting. So even some of the participants who, who could have been involved in um, adding graffiti could later change their mind as to uh, what the monument looks like. So, so these tensions are, are also something that we have to take into account. Thank you, Jane. Yes, um, and I think Tim, you wanted to come in on this uh, also? Yes, I'd actually like to follow up on <laughs> points that all three of you made and first you know Cher's point and actually Dwayne you alluded to this that not every statue is created equal. Um, you really have to look at its location, its artistic value, the iconography and the signaling as well as sort of evolving public perceptions of it. So there is no, I, I think it's very dangerous to apply a single you know, rule to any of this or, or to believe that, that you can do this. Um, what we find, and this is unfortunate in the world today with the polarization, that there seem to be two schools of thought on this. And the one is, you know, the retain and explain, which is very rigid. There's the other, which is, I, I love this term, you know, hope and or rope and hope, you know, and you just pull this down and see what happens. And you know what we really look for is something that as soon as a statue is gone, it's been removed, it eliminates, first of all, it eliminates that history, it erases it, and you can actually find more creative ways of, of dealing with this. And actually, maybe I would bring in a quick example here from Martinique of Empress Josephine, because I think it actually captures a lot of what's going on. Um, as by way of background, um, Empress Josephine was the wife of, uh, no, we should go, uh, yeah, there we are with her. Um, the important images on, on the far right, but in name it, Josephine was the wife of Napoleon. She, her family had plantations on the island of Martinique. The French Revolution had abolished slavery in 1803. Three, she allegedly convinced her husband to reintroduce slavery. I believe this is the only case in the 19th century where slavery was reintroduced. And then the, 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 the enslaved peoples of the, of the French colonies remained enslaved until 1848, I believe. What's interesting is this is a statue on the left of Josephine as she was, it was a statue erected of her sometime in the 19th century. She was then vandalized in the 1980s. Her head was decapitated and she was splashed with blood. Now the debate at that point was, well, do we replace the head? Someone said, well, if you do that, we'll just knock it off again. Well, for I think practically two decades, the statue remained then as this wonderful resignification of this monument that had once glorified her suddenly implicating her in you know slavery you know you see she's been daubed with red paint to look like blood now to Dwayne's point about the evolving attitudes last summer during the, and this was actually one of our favorite examples over the last five years to show how you can resignify a monument in public spaces. It retains the memory, but re, redefines it for the era. It was then toppled last summer and significantly damaged, you know, one could almost say destroyed. There were discussions about whether do you put back the original Josephine 
do you, or do you put back the van, quote unquote vandalizer, the resignified Josephine, a sentiment among the young generation in Martinique was not to replace it at all because they wanted to move beyond an identification with the legacy of slavery. They're living in the 21st century. We don't want to be defining ourselves around it. So this is a completely redefined attitude. Um, and it's just, you know, I think showing by retaining statues, you know, you can reconfigure them, you can resignify, you can put up a counter monument, you can contextualize. There's so much you can do with it that by leaving it in place, um, I think it just opens up so many more possibilities um, for a statue like that. Um, thank you, uh, Tim. I think Harriet uh, has wants to come back on this. Harriet, you're on mute. I actually want to come at this in a couple of ways. And if we could have the image of the Theodore Roosevelt statue in front of the Museum of Natural History while I start. One is this issue of is it censorship or isn't it? And the uh, reason, um, the one of, yeah, you're going to get it in a minute. Um, why do we not have a problem or why do some of us not have a problem with censoring works of art in ways that we would never censor works of literature. Uh, a while back, longer than I care to think about, I once did an article on why is the First Amendment more applicable to words than it is to images. And I have not got that sorted out to my satisfaction. But the other part of that becomes an issue when um, is there one with the statue as well before we get to this one? Thank you. Yeah, that's the one. Um, what if the work is of a really high quality of art? Um, this particular sculpture, which was a real flashpoint in New York for quite a while, uh, was done by the sculptor named Fraser, who was St. Gaudens' chief assistant. He was had a very um, substantial reputation in his own right. And if any of you have um, an American nickel with a buffalo on it, you actually have a Fraser sculpture in your pocket. Um, so the objections to this work of art, and now I'm going to go into just keeping in mind, this is a major work of art that is, it will shortly be removed. What happens when we remove things and how wrong can that go? And I will talk about how wrong that can go in a moment when I show you what the plan is. And this is very recent. This has just been uh, decided on the next day. If we can go back to the full statue for a moment and then we'll come to this one. Thank you. Um, the objection to this, in case anybody was lucky enough to miss this controversy, was the fact that Roosevelt was on the horse and the standing figures on either side were not, and that this composition was perceived to portray a racial hierarchy that is certainly not um, acceptable anymore today. When I did do some research on this um, a while ago for the museum for their exhibition, I came to the conclusion that at the time, the standing figures were meant to represent allegories of the continents where Roosevelt hunted and there are behind them on the facade of the museum, animals that represent those continents and also possibly allegorical depictions of his guides because he was an avid hunter and many of his uh, trophies are now in the museum as part of their permanent collection. We can certainly talk more about that if anybody has questions. Can I have the next one now? So. The museum decided only after protests for a while that really escalated after um, the George Floyd killing. And the museum said, you know, well, we knew this was a problem. Well, they knew it was a problem, but they didn't do anything until people started screaming really loudly. And there really was an issue of you could hardly go into the museum anymore without that conflict kind of jumping up in your face. So what have they decided to do? They're going to remove the statue 
and instead they widened the stairway. So with the idea that this would make it more open and inclusive and somehow less imperial, it's really rather ironic that what it does is focus on the entry facade, which is of course an imperial Roman facade. So there's no question that that was the intended meaning when uh, Pope designed the redesigned the facade. So that's one thing that's happening. The other thing that's happening is in the pavement somewhere over here, not exactly where the statue was, there's going to be a bronze raised engraving in the shape of the base. And it's going to have some kind of text explaining why the statue, which you can no longer see, was removed. So my guess is that most people will just walk right over it and not see it, but you might feel it under your feet. And those of you who are familiar with the Stolpersteine in Berlin, the stumbling stones in Berlin, you brought this up the last time, Tim, that put me in mind of it, may feel, you know, the stumbling stones in Berlin were used to mark the um, absence of people who had been either killed or tortured by the Nazis. Well, you might want to extend that to the particular statue. And I'm raising this, yeah, exactly. And this may be, I mean, it'll be bigger and it'll be in the base. Thank you for bringing up that image. Um, that's a connection that not everybody will make, but I thought it might be interesting to share it. My concern is nobody's gonna have a clue as to what went on here, right? A clue, you're gonna walk up the stairs and, and welcome to the Imperial Arch of the Museum of Natural History. We have erased a certain history and in a certain way we've really made it worse now we i mean they have really made it worse so as i said the text has not yet been confirmed the roosevelt statue is scheduled to go to an institution that focuses on the life and history of roosevelt that institution has not been named as yet i have some guesses but I'm, they were only guesses so i won't share them and that's where we are now. Thank you, Harriet. I, I, that actually answers a question that has come in on the, the chat there. And um, I just might remind you, I think uh, Gronje is keen for the Q&A function uh, to be used for, for some questions. But a question came in around absence. If it's absent, then we are missing uh, missing a link of, of, of in some kinds of historical shifts. Dwayne, you've been uh, patiently had your hand up there and then Cher and then Tim. So I'm going to go to you, Dwayne, first, please. Uh, thanks. This question of erasure and, and absence is 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 really fascinating. It it, it like uh, uh, I'm compelled to write this uh, to write a text uh, with the title. But you're erasing history, like people throwing their hands up and saying you're erasing history if you remove monuments. So I think at the core of that piece of logic is a problematic conflation between commemoration in public culture and the documentation of history. So. Um, if we take as uh, an assumption that public space is scarce, valuable, and the preserve of the values that a democratic order considers to be shared and valued, then we have to think very carefully, then it shifts our perspective on what kinds of images we want to have located in that public space. And if people of color and other minorities highlight that public art is violent and highly problematic, then those voices should be taken into consideration. By removing those statues, you do not remove the history of those events. Um, those histories are documented into, in perpetuity in, uh, in the many texts that you can find in libraries. So there's a distinct difference between commemorating certain histories and having those histories erased. So you cannot effectively erase those histories because they are documented in, in, in perpetuity. The other question about uh, absence and absence only working when it is, when something, if you know what wasn't there in the very beginning, I think 
um, at its example was, was really wonderful for um, showing one strategy for highlighting that which wasn't there before. So you can uh, mark absences in very creative and distinctive ways that uh, do reflect on why something was removed, how that plugged into evolving public sentiment as to how a democratic order is evolving and shifting and changing. So it's really important to uh, trouble and, and unsettle a conflation between erasure, commemoration, and history that seems to um, uphold certain strategies of the retention of signage that is sometimes really, really violent, especially for minority groups. Thank you, Twain. Um, Cher, you had your hand up uh, there a while as well. Yeah, th thank you. If we could go to the Black Lives Matter Plaza, I had uh, an image of, please. Uh, I'll give you a moment to get there, I know. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it's, yeah, they're right there, thank you so much. So um, I'm sure that, uh, people in, in other countries around the world that a particular moment of reckoning had come with the murder of George Floyd uh, during the, the pandemic last year. And I just wanna make sure that, you know, I, I think that that was indeed a, in many ways a flashpoint for the Black Lives Matter movement, but we have to remember, you know, before that happened, um, there was Ahmaud Aubrey, and then afterwards Rayshard Brooke, and years before Michael Brown and Eric Gardner and Freddie Gray and Trayvon Martin and Tony McDade and uh, Breonna uh, Taylor and Michelle Shirley and Tamir Rice, right? We have so many people um, who uh, have died, uh, were not have died, were murdered at the hands of racial violence in this country. And it tells us a lot about systematic and institutional racism and police brutality and really how much work is left to go. Um, this idea of putting history literally under your feet, I think sometimes it can work way better than other times. I think Harriet's um, pointing out a problematic with the Roosevelt um, situation that occurred to me as well because she had sent the images of what the proposal was and I literally didn't see the plaque at first. All I thought was, oh my God, this only further enhances the imperial framework, right? The colonialist framework of the triumphal arch in, in a way that might not have been anticipated. And so uh, to, to um, pick up on Dwayne's app point as well. Like, well, when, because this has been a question I asked for a long time and I've, I've worked with my students a lot on it. Like, how do you do absence? How, how does absence, you know, get announced? Uh, sometimes an absence can be the strongest presence you can make. I'm going this afternoon to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And many of you may know that it famously had its works, many works stolen in 1990 and they still have empty frames, for example, hanging up due to the restrictive kind of estate and trusts of Miss Gardner. And it's, it's a wallop every time you walk in the room and that absence, because it is literally, but also figuratively and metaphorically framed, you see it. Uh, Black Lives Matter, the plaza, and you can also see the attendant uh, road signage uh, on the image on the right. I think it's a really important example of how history gets put under our feet and at the moment that it's happening. Uh, this was painted on uh, the 5th of June, uh, which was Brian would have been Brianna Taylor's birthday uh, in 2020. It was at the direction of the mayor of Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Bowser. Uh, and that's when she also renamed the area Black Lives uh, Matter Plaza. Uh, it was in response also to when Trump was president at the time, this very militaristic federal response he had to the protests. People were protesting by and large very peacefully. And he really wanted to do a photo op, some of you may remember in the news, and had the area cleared um, by military so that he could cross the street and have a photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church during which he held a Bible upside down. Uh, and it was so offensive to so many people. It, it was that uh, it wasn't just the gesture, but it was kind of like his taking of the place and how do we reclaim it? How do we take it back? And so one of the gestures was right to, to literally paint the street with these large letters that could be seen 
from far and wide, particularly from the White House, but also to mark the site. Um, this is at um, the at kind of the corner of 16th Street that's nearest to the White House where the, the uh, incident actually occurred. So it was about, right, not just saying we don't want to forget and we want to remember, but the specificity of the site and the location and the marking of it. And uh, again, the idea of history being under your feet. If we can go, ahead for just a moment in my slides to the emancipation group right after this one. Thank you. That idea of absence is presence again. I think it, it can be very evocative. So in um, Boston right now, we've just gone through a major, uh, a major process uh, with this particular sculptural group by Thomas Ball, who also uh, sculpted the very famous image of George Washington here in the public garden, which constantly gets um, re or poorly, you know, um, mistakenly identified as Paul Revere, because if you put a guy on a horse in, in Boston, everyone wants it to be Paul Revere. But he was a well-known local sculptor. The Emancipation Group is actually um, a, a, a sculptural group of Lincoln, and he's freeing a specific slave, uh, Mr. Archer. And this is a copy of the original that's in DC and is still in place. Uh, the idea though of really listening to how people feel about the sculptures became very palpable for us last year. Um, it, for years it was discussed that it should be removed and not much happened. And then uh, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protest, a, a really um, wonderful local artist uh, who happens to be a, a young man of color, uh, Tori Bullock got a petition going and got over 12,000 signatures. And what happened there was phenomenal. I actually got to be on a panel um, with Tori, but also Harry and I got to listen in on the, um, the public talkback sessions. They had a series of public town halls and it was the most evolved uh, conversation I had where people of different point, views, views of point or points of view were actually listening to each other. And you could hear, you know, I think Tori had said, you know, it's so painful for me to have this in the public space. I, I can't, it's, it's wounding me. And I think that, you know, it really, people started to understand little kids who were there were allowed to speak and, and it was great that they spoke uh, of their sentiments and feelings, but you had even, um, a living family member of Mr. Archer speak with a, a bit of a different point of view, but ultimately it was decided that it would be removed. Uh, it has since been removed. You're looking on the left where it was still in place on the right. As it stands, I just walked by yesterday. Uh, the pedestal is still there. There is a plan to do something else in the space. We don't know what that's going to be yet. We also don't know where the sculpture group is going to go, but that pedestal is so distinctive there's no way you can miss the absence. Now, there is a way also, if I could just say one more thing, to do a kind of a flat flush mount absence marker that I think can work, that I think part of the problem Harriet's highlighting is it, it doesn't seem to go far enough, the proposal at the Roosevelt site. There's a wonderful artist named Steve Locke who used to be based in Boston, and he did a proposal for a memorial to a slavery auction block here in Faneuil Hall, which is actually named for a, a man who was a slaver and made much of his money from the slave trade. And his intention was right on the site where um, people were enslaved and were bought and sold. Uh, to have a bronze marker flush in the ground that would be heated to the temperature of a human body uh, around the year so people could stand on it, could feel it. And even in Boston, on, with all the snow, we would get the heated area would remain, you know, kind of clear. And it was very subtle. Uh, it did not happen here. I think it will happen somewhere else. I can get into that, what kind of went wrong with the commission if anyone has questions about it. But what I wanna say is that there might be a way to have these subtle uh, gestures that are under your feet or sometimes less subtle or these ways of marking that really still do get people's attentions. I think the worry is sometimes if the removal happens and the marking or the acknowledgement of the removal is not careful, distinctive, clever, um, powerful, evocative enough, that's where we start to get worried where the historical trail has gone. So part of the question for all of us in removal, and I'm sorry this has been long, but I'm knitting it together myself in my mind. If we're going to remove, 
It's okay, and then what? And then how? Because if the removal alone happens, it might not really getting out of the root of the problem of why the removal occurred in the first place. So how do we mark after? How do we take the next step? Thank you, Sharon. I, I think that's really interesting. I, I'm aware, I think, Tim, you had your hand up in relation to this a while ago. Um, but um, interject before you start, just to comment that in Ireland, we've had a number of relocated statues. And I think sometimes that relocation um, becomes part of a, a very interesting and complex question around geo-specificness um, in relation to memorial sites. But um, perhaps that, that may come up uh, later on. Tim, uh, you had your hand up for some time. You're on mute. Three quick points that I want to do an image, one responding specifically to share with what do you do with an empty plinth or, or pedestal. There was, I think everyone will remember the famous example of Edward Colston last year, who was toppled in the city of Bristol, rolled through the streets, and then dumped in the harbor. And um, that image should come up there, um, where are we? There should be another one. There may be the very last one. There it is, okay. There's so there you see Colston as he stood for about a century. Then last spring, um, shortly after George Floyd was killed, actually we can now say murdered, um, being dumped in the harbor. Then the plinth was empty and the question was, what do we do with it? An artist named Mark, Quinn took an image of one of the protesters, a woman named Jen Reed, and he created this sculpture. And about a month later, this was a guerrilla, guerrilla action, you know, installed her on the same plinth. The city let it stand, I think, for a day, and then it was removed, um, which is unfortunate because I think it, it filled that space very powerfully. Everyone knew who had stood there. And it was this wonderful juxtaposition that I think they're still trying to figure out what to do with the plinth. But on the empty spaces one, the second point I wanted to make was the image of Nantes. And I think this is a very powerful example of what you do with a public space, bringing in historical memory without overwhelming it. This is where Nantes was the largest slave trading port on the continent of Europe. This was the quay from which the ships, the slave ships departed. Um, and each of those bricks, the glass bricks, has the name you see up in the upper left hand corner, the, the name of the ship and then the year it departed. And I thought, I think the beauty of this is it's a reminder, it fills in the space of what actually happened there without overwhelming it, because you can take a walk along the river and just enjoy the evening, even the aesthetics of that. But you look down and it is a reminder of what happened. It's a massive atrocity, but on an individual basis. And then to link those atrocities or those horrors with the modern day, they've begun to take um, the stones and people who have perished in, these, in the Mediterranean and the, the trade that's been going on, the trafficking, um, those has been put in there. This is a three-year-old boy who drowned in the Mediterranean and is also there. So it links the, the past with the present um, without overwhelming the public space. And then finally, because I know our time is short, but I would punt this question back, I think to Harriet, and to say, we've talked about these removals, Colston probably should have gone, but the question is with something like Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, all statues are not equal and we don't remove all of them, we don't leave all of them. And was there any alternative? Were there suggestions of how that may have been recontextualized, re resignified, reconfigured in a way, even with a counter monument. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Harriet, you had your hand up and then uh, to let me, let me respond to Tim first and just share. 
some of the um, suggestions that came up at some of the public meetings. And this uh, goes back to this notion of why is it okay to censor works of art or alter them. There was one suggestion, several suggestions, more than I would have imagined, to just remove the standing figures and leave Roosevelt on horseback. Well, this is a major work of art and you just can't do that. It's like, well, we'll cut out chapter one and we'll cut out chapter three, but we'll read around it. But some individual suggested taking the statue of the African um, and putting it in uh, downtown in the African burial ground. I'm like, I don't think that's the message you want to convey. Besides, I don't think you should cut apart, you know, cut apart a work of art. I want to make the point about those two standing statues that they are not abject in any way. They represent uh, figures that have some, you know, standing in their own context. I also want to go back to the point that Duane made. And yes, when should we remove these things, if when? And I want to put out a suggestion that I keep coming back to, which doesn't answer everything, uh, but it's a good beginning point, I think. And that is if the reason you want to take it down is the same reason you put it up, it should go. And that totally works for Confederate monuments. It becomes much more complicated when we talk about the Roosevelt, because that is not at all the reason it was put up. It was put up to celebrate Roosevelt's contributions to conservation and education and things that pertain to the museum at the time. It did not go into the fact that a lot of his contributions to conservation were made at the expense of Native Americans because he took their land. And to go back to Tim's thought, what could have been done? I did not hear a single suggestion of reciting that made any kind of constructive sense. What would have seemed to me to make sense, and I'm, I'm right now ignoring the fact that I don't know in terms of weight bearing constraints, whether you could do this. It's a big statue, weighs a lot, right? Not all floors are gonna hold it. But if it had been put elsewhere in the museum and education programs created around it, I was recently involved with an anthology that came out not that long ago called Teachable Monuments. I think all monuments are teachable, which doesn't mean that I think they should necessarily be left in the spaces that they are, where they take on an additional public content or they become, so to speak, the mouthpiece of the institution that becomes, you know, way more problematic. Um, in terms of the empty base, I'm kind of jumping around to comments that others have made. One of the suggestions for the Museum of Natural History, which was made by Gonzalo Casals, who is um, the Director of Cultural Affairs in New York City, he said, well, leave the base, you know, following the notion of the empty plinth in Trafalgar Square, and just keep putting up different statues or different performances or different things over time. I have a certain amount of empathy with the museum feeling that they needed to get this out of their way, right? But I think if they'd taken it inside, it would have solved a lot of the problems. And I also wanted to make one comment about how site matters. And that uh, refers to the Emancipation Memorial or the Freedmen's Memorial, which Cher was talking about in Boston. I recently went to see it in a, the original in its location in Lincoln Park, which is a nice middle-class suburban area in DC where the park, you know, there are all kinds of other things going on. They're having yoga classes, what have you. And while I was there, a number of black individuals of various ages came by and took pictures of the statue, would not in apparent protest, but more in apparent admiration. I didn't have time to have a conversation with them. I think that's a very problematic image and I was very surprised to see that. But the other thing that takes place at Lincoln Park is that a little ways away from it is a statue of Mary Bethune who was a black educator who was very important. And if you look at those two together, you could have a very teachable moment or at least a very interesting conversation.
Thank you, Harriet. Um, Dwayne, you've had your hand up there. Uh, th uh, thanks, Neva. And, uh, there are so many parallels here that 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 um, uh, make um, th that really trouble um, easy moves to either absence or or uh, retention. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the fact that absence has been a part of mon commemorative culture for 30 years already. Um, if you go back to Berlin and the the kind of anti-monumentalist movement that occurred there in the early 1990s. The most famous example of that is the anti-fascist monument in Hamburg, which was um, systematically buried. So rather than having uh, unveiling ceremonies, they had sinking ceremonies. Every time it, it sank into the ground, there was an, a, a new celebration of the, of the modern. And now it is absolutely absented, it's, it's there. Um, the, the, the big absence of the World Trade Centers in, um, in New York City, the huge voids, the voided void that we find in the Jewish Museum in um, Berlin. So absence has been a, a, a really important aesthetic feature of commemorative culture for the last 30 years. We've been thinking about it deeply for a long while. And so it's striking that suddenly we're surprised by this question of, so how do we deal with absence? We've been thinking about absence for a long time. Um, and I have to think back to the examples of, of, of removal of uh, problematic signage in South Africa. So if Roshan can please um, upload images one and two um, from that, that I shared with you. Um, one of the issues that we faced in, in post apartheid South Africa was that Racialized discrimination was inscribed into public space in uh, very significant and, and ordinary ways. So here you see a picture of a, a public installation, which was designed by a local Catonian artist, um, Roderick Souls. Um, it depicts two benches on the left hand side. Um, the bench is for whites only. And on the right hand side is a bench for non whites only. Um, <clears throat> It is a post-apartheid monument that is a replica of the kinds of racial segregation that was seen all across South Africa. All public amenities were separated according to race. Buses, uh, trains were segregated in these very petty ways. And um, as someone who was not born during apartheid, um, I did not see any of the signage. I live in a, uh, my experience of, of post-apartheid society is of a segregation free society, right? So there are no signs. And so uh, my, uh, it, my instinct is, well, um, it would be useful to keep, to have kept some of the signage, but kept it up with some kind of uh, commemorative plaque so that people know exactly how petty and denigrating the violence was. Because effectively, um, as one of my interlocutors said uh, in an interview at these benches um, and, and from other interviews as well, um, most ordinary uh, people of color said it, it wasn't so much grand apartheid that, that, that was denigrating, it was petty apartheid. It was, it was your everyday interactions with the edifice of, of the apartheid um, racial segregation system that really inscribed very deeply that you were different and in fact that you were inferior. So I wondered about that. Was it helpful and was it useful to remove all the signage? Uh, could some of it been, have, have been kept up? And so this uh, monument, which was actually, it's not a state-sponsored monument, it's a, it's a private monument. It's outside a building called um, what was used to be called the Race Classification Board, uh, a site where you would go as a person of color to be reclassified. Um, and most of the time uh, you wanted to be reclassified as of a lighter shade so that you could uh, gain more privileges under the apartheid state. And so the, the, the site specific nature of, the, of this installation is really important. It's very popular, it's very eye-catching, um, and also very surprising for the public that go past, uh, past the monument. On the benches, you can see here some of the um, inscriptions of the legislation 
um, enforcing the racial distinctions in apartheid. So while in some cases I'm an advocate for removal, in, in other cases I am an advocate for um, the retention for purposes of, uh, of memory. In part also because the reconciliation project in, in, in post-apartheid South Africa is in many ways also a, a project of amnesia, a project where uh, a, a kind of bargain that was struck for uh, a free, a racially free democratic uh, order, um, yet there was no uh, socioeconomic justice that came with that. So while in principle, uh, many people of color are free, uh, poverty and inequality uh, were perpetuated. And so um, the symbolic justice does not equate with, uh, with the kinds of justice that, that comes with the promise of a new political dispensation. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, I see just uh, before I go to you, share a specific question, Dwayne, um, in relation to what you've just uh, been talking about, that perhaps absence is also a positive deinstitutionalization of public space. And I wondered if you'd like to respond to that briefly before I, I um, go to share has had her hand up there. I definitely do believe that it can be a, a positive deinstitutionalization of public space, because if we buy into a set of assumptions about public space being democratic, free and open for all to enter into and to participate, then um, the removal of, of statutes that are considered to be problematic for minorities who have been oppressed for a long time, uh, the removal of those statutes does mark the deinstitutionalization de of that public space. Thank you. Um, sure, you had your hand up there. You Thank you. I, I wanted to say um, with the, the point that Dwayne just made that in sometimes you're in favor of removal and sometimes not. I think that that is honestly the best answer we can give. My students get frustrated sometimes because I'll often say, I feel like we're still working on a case by case basis. As Tim was talking about earlier, not all these works are the same. They had, weren't intended to achieve the same aims. Aims. I think that the guidepost that Harrod has given us, if the reason you put it up is essentially the reason you wanna take it down, that, becomes very helpful, but she also noticed the nuance. Like it, it sometimes it's much clearer with a work uh, such as the Confederate um, pieces I started with, as opposed to maybe the the Roseville. And I was thinking about I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. There's this very charming and, and very smart um, television show called The Good Place, and it's all it's got a, it's hysterically funny, but it's got this philosophical basis and they're dealing a lot with issues like existentialism and nihilism. And just recently I had seen an episode where they said, oh, as the world gets more complex, it gets harder and harder to be a good person. And I was thinking that that kind of applies to maybe the way we work as scholars. As the world becomes more layered, more rich and we're more aware of these layers and we care about them, but it also becomes sometimes more difficult for us to figure out um, how are we good scholars? What are the right decisions? And sometimes I think, you know, people will assume that if you kind of stake out not a, you know, a, a position that's at one end of um, a, a, a spectrum or the other, but the murky space in between is actually the most radical position. To sit with things being unsettled and let ourselves be uncomfortable is sometimes very productive. And I wanted to make the point that sometimes temporary art can let us do that much more than a lot of permanent pieces. If, um, if um, Roseanne, if you can um, put up my piece from Mastery Studios, the projection um, projects, so in Boston, after the murder of Mr. Floyd, we have a, a group of talented artists, they're a collective and they, they operate in stealthy ways. They um, often temporarily install these projects. Perfect, thank you, um, without any permissions, right? 
uh, they had decided that they were going to do these projections. The one you're seeing on the left is on, on the state house in Massachusetts. And the one you're seeing on the right is on the District A1 police station, also in Boston. They basically have equipped a, a van uh, so they can drive around and do these projections. And these were intended to memorialize uh, Mr. Floyd shortly after he had been murdered. When um, they went to the police station, they were honestly expecting to receive a lot of confrontation. And the two main artists from the collective who worked on this were Sam Okerstrom Lang, you can see their names there, and Caleb Hawkins. And Caleb Hawkins in particular often kind of blogs about these um, experiences, and particularly because he is a person of color and what it's been like for him to kind of make work in a public space. And they had such a different reaction from the police. The police came out and looked at it with them. They thought they were going to come and shut it down. And the officers were saying to them, well, we love this. This is a great piece. They were expecting to be told and that they had to leave and shut it down. They were even parked where they weren't supposed to be in police parking. And the police just told them, you know, take your time. When you're ready, though, please make sure you get the car out of there because we do need to let other you know, squad cars park there. And they were kind of so taken aback by this response. And I, I do wanna say that I don't wanna always um, feel so negative. I think there are also spaces for real hope, discussions of maybe if we can't get to reconciliation, but dialogue that is genuine, that cannot, that is authentic, that cannot be pre-planned, that cannot be predetermined. You know, and, and maybe these are some of the spots where we can open up those dialogues, especially I think um, temporary public art. You don't have to worry if you're offending somebody, it's gonna be gone shortly anyway, usually. It's so if someone who might normally complain, they don't even get the opportunity to do so. You can really deal with hot button uh, political issues. I found that myself in my work with the city of Boston on the uh, Boston Marathon bombing memorial, they asked me to look specifically at doing some temporary um, kind of interventions. And I think those are going to be some of the most fruitful ones and quite frankly will outlast what the city has done in terms of a, a temporary way. So um, when Dwayne was talking about how we deal with absence, I think it may be kind of a last thing to, to consider is um, that can be a really thorny situation. I remember hearing Tori Bullock say once to talk about signage specifically, it doesn't work to put a description up next to my pain. And when Tori said that it really resonated, I'm sure not just with me, but with other people. And so what happens to the pedestal that remains or what often also becomes the problem, people say, let's, where should this work be? We'll put it in a museum, it'll give it context. I remember I have a good friend who is a museum registrar and she said, people who were donating works often said, oh, we thought of you on our way to the dump. Now, if it was a work you didn't necessarily want, you're now expecting the museum to absorb that, to spend resources it wasn't counting on. It never looked to access this work and bring it to his collection. It may not have people who have the expertise to contextualize it or the physical or ideological or metaphorical space to host it. So, Dwayne's question about kind of how we deal with absence and where things go, I think is extremely important. And I want to pair that with, you know, Tori's words for us to be very mindful of storage that sometimes, or excuse me, signage, that putting up a, a sign, a description of someone's pain is either not enough, or in many ways, it, it, it's not the way we can answer the absence best. And it's so dissatisfying to say, but it's like a one size fits all garment. It never fits anyone well, right? It's too big, it's too small, it's too long, it's too short. We need multiple strategies and tactics for dealing with additions and removals and responses to our public space. Because if we're gonna take that assumption that Duane has mentioned multiple times, if we're really saying everyone's invited, then we can't possibly expect any kind of one size fits all solution to work. That's where we're doomed when we think, well, that worked over here. Let's try and replicate that response here. So I just wanna be mindful. I'm also looking at the time. And so if I don't get to speak again, I just also want to thank so much Yevan and everyone who has uh, organized today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Cher. Um, Harriet, did you have your hand up there um, before Dwayne, I think? Thank you. So you are mute. 
part of that. Okay, just a word about absence. The absence that concerns me perhaps more than, than all the ones we've spoken about, and I really appreciate it, your remarks, Wayne, about absence as a strategy, but how do we reconcile the, thing, the people who were never present? I mean, that's been a really, really huge problem that has in a way generated all of this. I don't have an answer. As I said, when I began, I usually have more questions um, than I have answers for sure. But I also very, very rare moment want to disagree with Cher, where I do think that museums offer perhaps our best opportunity to have constructive conversations. When the Museum of Natural History put up an exhibition about the Roosevelt and the various arguments, although I had issues with that, I did spend some time there and had some really good conversations with people who were reacting to, you know, various, various of the opinions um, that were expressed. And one last point, which is what I made when I was on the mayoral advisory commission for the four works that caused us problems in New York, which included the Roosevelt, was, you know, we can take all these things down and they may be important symbolic gestures of the moment, but we haven't fixed the underlying issues. And I really wish that every um, so-called petition for removal or objection for removal came with a constructive uh, suggestion as to what might happen locally to address what some of these concerns are. Thank you, Harriet. And I think, Doreen, you had your hand up and share, and Timothy, and I am reminded. I, to I, just, I just had a very, very brief response to Harriet, if I may directly. Um, Harriet, we're not disagreeing again, because a lot of times you're right, the museum is the place, and I think with the Roosevelt it would be. But what I just want to say is I don't want us to get in the position that the museum becomes the default position, that every time where we don't know, it goes to the museum. That's what I meant. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yes. And I think the point, I think, Tim, and the, what Harry, the point you made there, right, if there's something wrong with the statues, I heard you say elsewhere, there's something wrong with the society. We need to look at that. But Dwayne, you had your hand up patiently there if you want to go ahead and then then. Uh, yeah, uh, on this on this point of absence, um, I, I'd like to ask uh, Rishan to um, upload uh, image number four. I want to highlight a uh, an example of the purposeful absenting of a monument as an art project. So here we see um, a group of gentlemen toppling a statue, uh, pulling up bricks and the remains of a commemorative work, stacking them up and spraying the words for free, mahala, on them. This is in fact an artwork, an interventionist artwork by the Dutch artist Jonas Stahl. And the interventionist artwork is called the uh, Monument for the Distribution of Wealth. It is in fact based on an abandoned post-apartheid commemorative project in the township of Soweto, where a commemoration of the youth student uprisings of 1976 was supposed to be a monument for that. Um, the, the construction work on the original uh, monument was abandoned, Jonas reports, due to the embezzlement of the funds that were dedicated for this monument. He went around in the township of Soweto to find out what the major issues were for residents in that area and their primary concerns were issues of poverty, inequality, housing. They needed materials to build their houses. They needed money. Um, they didn't need a monument. And there was an abandoned monument project in the district. And so the intervention played on this tension between the demands for symbolic justice for commemorating the past and the urgent contemporary demands for housing, for resources and materials. And in the process, absenting, disappearing, removing, and recycling a monument that was there. So um, I just wanted to put this on this example on the table as, as a, a very specific local South African uh, attempt to address um, uh, these uh, monumental issues of removal 
and how they can be employed in, in creative ways for recycling. Thank you, Twain. Um, Tim, I think you wanted to come in there. I'm conscious of the, the time we're at. Um, there's just maybe one or, one or two questions we might come to afterwards, but uh, Tim, I think you wanted to respond. Um, well, just actually wanted to add one element to this that we have not discussed. And that is that statues and monuments are objects that belong to someone or some entity. And they're also located somewhere that also has legal ownership. And the legal issue, I think, also needs to come into consideration, especially with some of the large public monuments, um, only because then, you know, thinking, Dwayne, going back to the road statue, it was actually protected by heritage laws in South Africa, but it was removed within 30 days. And if I'm remembering, they kind of had to retrofit everything to make it okay for the statue to go. The Robert E. Lee statue in Charlottesville, the reason that became so controversial was because it was tied up in a court system. We've seen cases in France where a controversial statue was on public land, which while the government was fighting over it, the municipality would sell it to a private entity to move it off of public land. So it still stands there and is still controversial. I just wanted to know, we haven't raised that, but for all of these other issues, there's a very important legal component that often comes into into play with, with all of these um, and more complex things, but one, one, one needs to understand that with everything else, there is a, a legal status. I remember finally with the Colston statue when they're planning on removing it, they actually couldn't figure out who it belonged to. You know, did it belong to the society that commissioned it? Did it belong to the city? Who had a right to remove the thing? And, and where was it supposed to go if you removed it? And I suspect with a lot of the Confederate statues, you're probably going to be facing a similar type of um, situation. Thank Just you. To cross that in. Thank you, Harriet. Well, one other thing, actually, Nivan, because this relates when you mentioned necropolitics, uh, and you had worked with necropolitics. We started with the Monument Avenue in Richmond. A, there's a statue to a Confederate general named A.P. Hill. Now, the problem with that statue is that his bones are, his remains are buried beneath the statue, which makes it very different from the statue of Robert E. Lee, which is there, because this is actually a grave site. And so what, beyond the legal issues, what are sort of the moral and the ethical issues around that? Anyway, sorry. I just wanted to echo the, the legal issues and we don't know who owns it. That was true of the Theodore Roosevelt that for a long time, it wasn't quite clear whether the state owned it or the city owned it. It was determined that the city owned it. And then once the city owned it, you got wrapped up in all the bureaucratic requirements that New York has. Hence, in addition to the pandemic, stretched the whole process out. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to um, thank you all. Before we uh, finish up, I think we'll have a look here. There's a question in. But, um, to the panel, are monuments art or containers for political sentiment? And Duane, you have uh, given a text response already to that. And I think I just want to put it to the rest of the panel, where there is a tension between the um, political sentiment value and the art value. And this has come up, uh, I think, right through the panel. But if any of you had any last thoughts on in response to that question, Harriet, that would be great you know, put it in a very pop context, pop culture context, what's art, capital A-R-T, got to do with it? Uh, because when we're dealing with memorials, I think we are, once we're in the public domain with memorials, we're dealing entirely with the content and the, the subject. Um, whether it's a really fine work of art or it's a commercial reproduction doesn't seem to make a difference if the topic is hot. How we get beyond that, I don't know. I wish the answer to that question were it's both because it can be both, but I think in general, that's not how we think about it. Okay, thank you, Harriet. Tim? 
Yeah, I think for any statue in a democracy, any democratic society, it is unlike a museum where you have to go in and see it, these monuments impose themselves on the public spaces. It, it, it contributes to a collective identity. And when you live in a democracy, in an evolving democracy, be it politically, demographically, ethically, morally, whatever the values would be, how, how does one deal with these statues in a, in a democratic and I think in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a method that has both principles and processes, but ultimately can reflect a, a democratic sentiment and the, the collective community at, at large. I'm pointing back to Harriet, her commission, I think has done a model job on public engagement and process in this, but just wanted to add that. So it is, they're both art, but they are also inherently political if they're in, in public spaces in democratic societies. Okay, um, Cher, do you want to um, come in on that? Yeah, I've talked for many years with my students about what is the mix of art and activism? Because it's often assumed that if it's good activism, it's gonna to have to lose something by the way of its artfulness, or if it's good art, that it's not gonna be very effective as activism. And that can be true. Um, when we, the first example I shared from the McNeil Marble Works, that's all about political sentiment that has very little to do with art. If you're ordering from a catalog and the figures are identical, and oftentimes the only way to distinguish between the Union and the Confederate soldiers is the, the slight touches they put on before they left the factory, right, then we, we know that we're dealing less with artfulness there. I think they can be both. And I think that sometimes it's the presence of mind that the artists have to reach the moment and to, to speak to the moment that exists. Uh, with the emancipation group that was recently removed in Boston, I think Thomas Ball, he thought he was speaking to the moment. And the problem was he was trying to be very artful. He's a skilled sculptor. Uh, although I think because it was the replica of what's in DC it was easier to remove it, but they was very much caught up in political sentiments. And there's an assumption with a lot of permanent work that what the people felt at the time they placed it is gonna continue to be felt. And we find that the history memory is a lot shorter. Sometimes it's not even 50 years. In a couple decades, people may not feel the same or even recall events in the way that they were memorialized. So I want to bring my attention to the last example I had shared for Mastery Studios, the temporary projection pieces, because I think they're both artful and they're powerful as activism uh, on literally putting kind of boots to the ground and having the difficult conversations. Uh, it works because it's also um, stealthy, but there's no pretense there to assume that the the moment they're speaking for at that point in time would necessarily be the same moment they're speaking to in the future or that they would necessarily use the same tactics. And I think what we have to find are artists who think deftly, who make works that are deft, and we have to find a, a way to absorb, understand, and, and really appreciate these gestures that don't try and nail down forever, but try to, in a way, speak to now acknowledging that it may not be everyone's vision of now, but trying to understand that you were speaking for a moment in time as you understood it at the place that you stood, right? And it might be very different for someone else. Uh, in in uh, Kandinsky's On Concerning Spiritual Art, you know, he, he wrote that, and I thought it was always very powerful, that you can only authentically know your own time. You can sympathize with others, but you can't empathize with it because you didn't live at that time. And we might say the same thing for other people, other cultures, other moments. We have to acknowledge as much what we don't know as what we do. And if we could figure out how to get what we don't know into the monument landscape, I think we'd be on better footing than we are right now. Thank you. Um, Dwayne, did you want to add to your uh, response uh, to that question? No, not necessarily, but, but I mean, uh, the very uh, nature of uh, uh, public artwork is that it is making political statements. So it's very difficult to distinguish the aesthetics from the, from, uh, the political statements that it, that it makes, intentional or unintentional. Just the nature of it being in public space means that it is participating in all kinds of um, 
civic and political codes of public protocol. Thank you. Um, we are, I think, out of time. There is a question I'll just direct you to very briefly. I don't think we have much time to go to it, but it, it builds on what you've just been talking about and something that came up in our earlier conversations about where is the artist in the commissioning process? So the reckoning around representation and commemoration is urgent and incredibly important. The example of Coulston and Mark uh, Quinn's, Coulston, sorry, Mark Quinn's controversial response arguably highlights the importance of how diversity of representation should perhaps be considered for artists too, i.e. along with review of content and subject matter, who is creating the work, which artistic voices are being heard given space, to create new work in public spaces needs to be considered. Do the panel have any thoughts? How might we achieve this? Is harnessing the commissioning process the answer? And I think earlier in the week, we saw in this very conference, the discussions about the importance of the brief um, and resource packs and working ahead of time in, in developing um, commissions. I think Creative Places Tune was a particular example that was, was discussed. But Duane, um, I'll come back to you. You have your hand up for that. You're on mute. I think, a, I think this is an important question: um, uh, the identity of the of the artists and how, and 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 it comes back to to, to Shear's point as well about Kadinsky's uh, text about identification. Right? Um, in the past, we've seen that it's really really important in some circumstances for uh, some commissions to be um, addressed by. Uh, people from certain communities who are affected by that particular work of art. So uh, new pieces to, to be designed by people from affected communities. But that is not necessarily a direct formula for a better commemoration in the future. Um, there are a number of examples of, of real disasters um, when um, a monument is redesigned and it's unveiled. And then there are more problems afterwards, even if, even if um, the, the artist who is commissioned is from that community. So in effect, there is no right formula for the design of a successful monument. There, there's so much serendipity and the politics around these matters move so quickly that um, you'll be surprised as to uh, what happens uh, along the way uh, of, of the development of a monument. So it's really important, um, but it, there is no formula for designing a successful monument. To conclude, could I ask um, Tim, uh, perhaps would like to come in on this. I think this is all we have time for. I think, uh, Roisin, if you, if you wouldn't mind putting up uh, Tim's image of the Berlin wall space. Um, and uh, over to you for a moment. So that, no, um, the, that one, yes. Okay, this, uh, I think this answers a lot of these questions. This is, first of all, you see on the right-hand side, this was the Berlin Wall being constructed. After the wall came down, literally came down, the two Germans came together, most of the wall was erased from the public landscape, but a two kilometer stretch of it was left and it was called the East, it's now called the East Side Gallery. And if you've watched this in the course of the last two or three decades, it is a very public space. It's a democratic space. Artists have come and painted it. When the wall was first painted, you looked at the images there, a lot of them were the breaching of the wall. It was all about German reunification. It were, there were images of Soviet leaders and East German leaders. And in the course of the decades, it changes with what, wherever the public sentiments are. And I believe probably if you went there now, there would be images related to the Black Lives Matter, but it's a, it's a public, it's a historical object, which was very painful, um, was erased in many places, however, was um, retained, re repurposed as a canvas and is, I think, reflects the evolving attitudes of, of the public. And in a sense, in a democratic society, is probably one of the most democratic monuments that, that exists. Um, 
and, and will continue to evolve with the course of time. So I think it's a, it brings a lot of these issues together in a, in a very wonderful way. Thank you, Tim. I think this is a great place to, to wrap up for today. Um, this fascinating and challenging panel conversation. Um, of course, this isn't the end, but the beginning, I hope, of new and extended conversations, dialogue and action. I want to thank the panel for your generosity uh, in sharing your time, experience, knowledge and insight into this topic today. Thank you so much. Before I pass over to Gronya, who is keen uh, to wrap up three days of a fascinating conference of presentations and performances. I would like to say a quick few words on behalf of Jenny Houghton, the Grange Gorman Development Agency and all the panel chairs. Organizing any public event while rewarding is challenging and complex. So behind the scenes here, Roisin Cahill and Tony Farrell were heroically supportive on technology and delivery. Thanks, thanks also to our, to our head of school here at the Dublin School of Creative Arts, Kieran Corcoran, for your constant commitment and support of the event and of Gronia. Added to the usual moving parts involved in organizing an event like this, Gronia, during a very busy and pressured few months, had to adapt to changing delivery format and all the vagaries and joys of technology. In the midst of all this, she managed to remain reliable, facilitating, very patient and calm and constantly enthused towards all of us involved in delivering elements of the conference over the last three days. I believe Jenny might be nearby, Gronia, um, to demonstrate this on behalf of all of us. Thank you so much. This is a, a virtual applause moment. Thank you. And oh, here's Jenny. <laughs> over to you, Gronia. Thank you. Bye. OK, um, thank you all for that. Um, I think it's really great to see that there's been so much support in this collaborative venture uh, that has been public art now. Um, I'm just going to conclude really briefly. Um, so to thank Nivan and the panel for such a stimulating and thoughtful conversation. Um, so I will uh, also extend our thanks on behalf of Public Art Now. Um, oh, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm getting people invading in my office right now. Um, but I'm going to continue on thanking everybody else who deserves to be thanked. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody who supported us, specifically uh, the arts and cultural institutions um, who assisted us both theoretically um, and practically with the development of this. Um, so I'd like to thank CREATE, the National Development Agency for Collaborative Arts, the Office of Public Works, Dublin City Council, Fingal County Council Arts Office, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Visual Artists Ireland, the Arts Council of Ireland and the Grange Gorman Development Agency. Additionally, I want to extend uh, thanks to our chairs and panelists for putting together such a diverse set of thought provoking conversations. Uh, Jenny Houghton of the GDA and Kieran Corcoran of TU Dublin for prompting this event into existence. And last but in no way least, thank you to the amazing production team, particularly my Zoom co pilot, Roisin Cahill, who has done an amazing job behind the scenes here, and also to our tech support, Tony Farrelly. So I think that's it. I might hand over to Jenny Horton now for a concluding statement. Well, I, I just want to say that uh, thank you, everybody. It's been a stimulating three days. And I particularly also want to thank the panel chairs. And um, that's Kieran Benson, uh, Brian Fay, Glenn Lockman, Colonel Vaughan and Neve and Kelly um, for holding this together and holding us together. Um, this is kind of midstream for the lives we live. This is the the, the various commissions and interventions happening here in Grange Gorman. So just to let you know that this book, we were to give it to you if you were here physically, but hopefully we can post it to you. And we are on a journey, we are on our way. There will be new voices, there will be new, new ways of working and hopefully improved methods as well. Um, so this is, um, we are midstream in the lives we live. We do have primary stakeholders in the health sector, uh, TU Dublin communities, many, many communities, and educate together in young people. So it's very complex, multi-layered um, uh, uh, um, sort of in, in, I suppose, time that we're spending with artists and people right across the communities. So um, to date, I think 27 
are just at least 50 communities, some existing, some new ones have been formed in this process. So it's an ongoing journey for us. Um, but the purpose for today really is to be in this engine room and to thank, um, uh, really to thank Gronia Cochrane, who's been an outstanding conference uh, coordinator for us. And she's kept the rigor, she's kept the focus, and we are extremely grateful to her. And then supported by um, Roisin Cahill, from the GDA, who is absolutely wonderful in the background and all that screen sharing and all the connections and how it's worked so smoothly. So we are absolutely thrilled, delighted and honoured that you've done this for us and with us. Um, and we look forward to working with you again in the near future, I hope. Um, and then my colleague, Kieran, who I think is um, part of the Public Art Working Group. Um, and we are lucky we have had a wonderful public art working group that have kept us on course as well. So there's, there's um, Roshi, you can see the faces, finally, and Gronya, and thank you very, very much. Um, I hope we've added to pedagogy in relation to TUW. Um, and I apologise to all the many, many artists um, that we haven't been able to platform here, but we will in 